Randy, obviously it is always a pleasure to speak with a legend like yourself. I had a chance to finish watching your PFL documentary uh, this morning, actually. Uh, you've done a million interviews since retiring from fighting, but uh, how was it to kind of encapsulate everything into this uh, four-part series? Man, I, it, uh, it was amazing. I was honored that, that uh, PFL pr promotion and production company asked if, if, if they could do this and tell this story. Uh, obviously family, friends, college teammates, a college coach, uh, a whole bunch of people got involved. Uh, uh, pretty, pretty cool, man. Uh, definitely, definitely honored. It's funny because I, you know, I, you, you, you fought for so long. And when I watched this, I was like, you know, it doesn't feel like Randy, you know, Randy, you fought not that long ago. And I looked, I was like, it's actually 10 years this year. Like I didn't even, I was at your final fight and I was like, I didn't realize it's been 10 years. Like I just always assumed like, oh, it's only been like two years since Randy fought. <laughs> yeah, I know it's been, it's been a while for sure. But obviously you, uh, but when you look back, I mean, it was kind of cool because, you know, you got to do a lot of stuff with that. I got to be honest. My favorite part was the, uh, the sit down with Chuck. That was so cool to see you guys sit down and kind of talk about that epic trilogy. Cause that trilogy meant so much to the sport. I mean, that was at a time when the sport still wasn't, you know, what it is today in terms of, you know, leagues and, and, and hype and attention and, and that trilogy, you know, still stands as like one of the greatest trilogies, one of the greatest moments in, in mixed martial arts history. Oh man. Oh, thank you. And, and thanks to Chuck. I was really happy that he was willing to step up. We've, you know, we've always been friends. We've always gotten along. I knew him when he was at Cal Poly, you know, wrestling for, for Cal Poly and, uh, uh, things led, led and worked out the way they did. Uh, I think we were both excited to be coaches in that first season, of the ultimate fighter. And I think in a lot of ways that, uh, changed the landscape for our sport. Absolutely. It did. I mean, it changed so many things. I remember, the hype around the fights and, and cause I remember like there, like, I, I think that was one of the first times I can remember either the first or the second fight. I can't remember which one it was, but it was like, people were having parties to watch the fight. And that was the first time I could remember, you know, co I've covered the sports since 2003. That was the first time I can remember people legitimately like we're having a party to watch a fight. And like, that was like, so, so foreign to us at that point. Cause like back in the day, you had to like try to find a bar that might be showing the UFC paper. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was different for sure. Uh, you know, getting thrown off cable and all the other stuff that happened in the sport. I mean, it looked like the sport was going to die. So, uh, you know, to see it recover, rejuvenate, and, and in a lot of ways become the combative sport for this generation uh, and grow globally the way it has, it's been pretty remarkable. Yeah. It's funny watching that documentary. I kind of forgot about the lead up to the Tito fight. I mean, I know Tito is, is a guy who, you know, never really closes his mouth. He likes to promote his fights. He likes to say crazy things, but I, I kind of forgot about some of that pre-fight stuff because obviously I remember the aftermath, but it was so funny rewatching some of that stuff. And then obviously we know how the fight played out. Yeah. Well, Tito is really in a lot of ways, the, the precursor and the guy that set the stage for that kind of marketing for, for guys chattering, creating a persona, uh, using their mouth to promote, to promote fights and create heat. And certainly that was something that Dana liked and, re and rewarded. And, and then, you know, guys like Phil Baroni, Chael Sonnen, and, and then obviously Conor McGregor kind of took that, elevated that to a whole new level. Yeah. But you've been a guy, I mean, throughout your career, Andy, you were never that guy. And it seems like, you know, coming from that wrestling background, which also seeing John Smith was awesome as a wrestling guy. It was so cool to see him in that documentary, but, uh, but being a wrestling guy, like it feels like where, you know, the early days of the UFC with the tournament style and then now obviously you're working with PFL, you know, working on the broadcast side, like it seems like that would have been a format that you were built for because you were never, you were never the guy to deal with the trash talk. You were never the guy who wanted to promote your fight by saying crazy things about your opponent. Yeah, I, I I I just tried to keep it simple. You know, I didn't didn't feel the need to create a persona or, or do any of that. It was never my style, and I felt like you know, if I walked out on that limb by talking a bunch of smack and running down my opponent, where does that leave me? If I lose the fight after all, <laughs> uh, it just didn't make a lot of sense to me. And and you're right. It's one of the things I love about the PFL is it is absolutely a meritocracy. It's about how you go out in that cage and score points and win. Uh, it's not about publicity stunts or, or running your head. So that, that certainly appeals to me. 
Yeah, I've talked to a lot of the fighters from the PFL, and they kind of have the same attitude. They're like, it takes all the politics out of it. It takes out, you know, you're not trying to talk yourself into a fight. You just go out there, you fight, you win, and, and you can win a million dollars. And, like, I'm sure when you first signed up to do your first fight in the UFC all those years ago, I'm sure a million dollars was like a pie-in-the-sky kind of dream. Oh, yeah, no way. I, I, I could have never saw that back then, for sure. Uh, <laughs> With the, the document, the other thing, I because, I, you know, it's funny, right? Like, as you're in your career, when you're doing things as a reporter, I know we're guilty of this. We're always asking you, like, oh, what you know, what you know, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about this part of your career? What do you think about this fight? And and almost every response from fighters is always the same. I'll think about that when my career's over. Uh, having this documentary, going back, hearing from guys like Tim Sylvia and, and, and obviously Chuck, and they're like, was it fun? Was it weird? Because you've always been such a humble guy. But I mean, we got to be honest, Randy. I mean, you put together one of the most legendary careers in the history of the sport. Well, I think it's for me. It's always weird seeing <laughs> myself on a television, on a billboard. You know, uh, it, it, I don't think I'll ever get used to that. It's, it's just something that's always going to. It kind of it, it's a bit strange, honestly. Uh, those guys were awesome. They were awesome to step up, Chuck. Tim, Coach Smith, you know everybody that agreed to be involved and and tell how our paths had crossed and how you know how we affected each other is a pretty cool thing. So, um, thanks to those guys for being involved and doing that. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's 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 flattering and and uh, uh, they're, they're you know they're great guys. They were great guys before we fought each other. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that's unique to our sport in MMA and something I hope that never changes is that camaraderie that we as athletes share. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's funny, Randy, I've covered your career for so many years, but the one thing that I really learned in that documentary was Randy Couture used to have a freaking head of hair, man. I saw some <laughs> pictures and some photos. I was like, geez, man, that guy had some lettuce on the top of his head. Yeah. I had some hockey hair in college. I think, <laughs> you know, join in the army at 19 and let my friends shave my head literally before I went to basic training. We had a party, a going away party, and my buddies all she took turns shaving my head. Um, and, and then, you know, being in the Army where that was a big deal, you know, being regulation, having having your hair cut. Uh, when I got out at, at 25 years old and went to Oklahoma State, that was the first thing I did was grew my hair out. And uh, I remember coach saying, hey, man, you need to get that hair trimmed up. You, I see you brushing it out of your face when you're in the middle of matches. That's ridiculous. So, uh <laughs> <laughs> that's funny uh, yeah that's funny one of the things that obviously they cover in the documentary and, and obviously you did so so much in your career was that your ability when you went from being heavyweight champion down to light heavyweight and then one of my favorite moments ever sitting in a crowd sitting you know as media for an event was when you fought tim sylvia here where i'm at in columbus ohio you mm -hmm. that fight going back to heavyweight. Now we've seen, you know, when you did that during those days, that was such a rare thing for a guy to go from one weight class higher or lower and, and win much less become champion. Now we're seeing it more often. We are seeing a lot more guys willing to move weight classes, become championship. And I, I don't know. You tell me, Randy, like when you did it, it felt really special because it was such a rare thing to do in the sport, but now guys are doing it so often I feel like it's losing a little bit of the uniqueness to it. I mean, am I wrong? Am I, I maybe it's like the, 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 the sanctity of the sport thing. Maybe I'm holding on to it too tightly, but like, I feel like, like when you did it, it was like, wow, this is an amazing moment. It's crazy. Never happened before. Now it's like every other event we're seeing somebody jump up or down in weight class. Well, I think it's a natural tendency. I think we've seen it in boxing certainly for years and, and guys, you know, moving up or down weight classes to get a particular fight or to win, you know, multiple titles. Um, so I, I don't think it's, you know, any more or less meaningful. I think those guys that have the ability to, to come down or up a weight and, and do that, or, you know, that, I think that's a, that's a, a normal thing. Uh, we as athletes want to be the best and uh, be considered the best. And so if you have the, you know, I felt like I was stuck between weight classes. I'm not a big, certainly not by any stretch, the imagination of big heavyweight, um, but, you know, when I started the sport, 15, 20 pounds was a lot to cut because there was, there wasn't the lightweight was anything under 200. <laughs> so, uh, you know, now we have, 
as many weight classes as we do, it's a little easier for guys to transition up or down and, and make weight in another weight and, and still compete and still be healthy and, and perform to their ability. So I don't think it takes away from it uh, that more guys have done it, more guys and gals, I think. Uh, yeah, I think it's still cool. Yeah. It's just, like I said, it was such a rare thing when you did that. And I know, again, you're not the egotistical guy, but when you look back and think about what you were able to do, I mean, obviously in the UFC right now, we got a guy in John Jones who's going to try to do it, you know, from light heavyweight and going up to heavyweight. We have seen guys, we have seen people move up in weight classes and have success, but, you know, we just saw recently Israel Adesanya, I think is one of the most tremendously talented people in the world. He took his shot and, 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 he, and he lost. There's no, no shame in losing, obviously, but it's not easy. But uh, you did it, you know, you did it. And 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 again, fighting Tim Sylvia, a massive guy for heavyweight. But like I said, as many guys or girls that are doing it, it's still not an easy feat to accomplish. No, I think it's always going to be a challenge. You know, Adesanya is a perfect example. I mean, coming in at, what was he, 196? You know, that, that probably as big as he's ever been. Uh, but he's still dealing with a guy that's cutting down from, 215 to 220 probably to make 205 and uh you know that sometimes that especially when all skill sets across the board are fairly equal that that size and power can make a difference yeah absolutely what i'm curious randy is a guy who, who has you know done it uh, in that weight class what do you think about john jones going to heavyweight are you looking forward to that I'll be interested to see. I mean, he's a big guy. He's a tall guy. He's, I think he's taller than I am. He's, I think he's six, three. I'm only six, one. Uh, he certainly has the frame to, to put on the mass. Uh, and, and technically he's as good as anybody. So it'll be interesting to see how he works around the bigger, stronger guys. Um, cause that is a challenge. You gotta, you gotta approach him differently. You don't want to go head up with a guy that's that big and that strong. Yeah, absolutely. The documentary covered so many things. And, and as a guy who did so many great things during your career, Andy, it's funny. Well, one of the things that added to the legend of Randy Couture was the story surrounding your heart attack, where you literally walked to the freaking hospital. And I know we all saw that story when it played out like on TMZ, but watching it again there, I was just like, dude, like, this is not human. Like, are you sure? Like, did they put a robot heart in? Cause I feel like you've got to be bionic at this point. Cause <laughs> nobody else could do that, Randy. Well, I mean, let's be honest. I'm going to get to the hospital a lot faster walking three <laughs> blocks than I would taking an Uber, riding a cab, or riding an ambulance in downtown Los Angeles. So, or West Hollywood, Hollywood, wherever, uh, it, it wouldn't matter. But, uh, it, you know, it was, I didn't think for a second I was having a heart attack. That's the truth of the matter. I, I, I was like, man, I couldn't get this ache to go away in my ribs. And I thought, you know, I popped my ribs or torn cartilage plenty of times. I thought that that was what was going on. Uh, it didn't really dawn on me that it was something more serious, like a heart attack. Yeah. But obviously you're doing well now. I know you're still training all the time, doing movies, obviously with the PFL. So, uh, a heart attack's not going to slow you down, man. I know that. No, I'm, I'm back to hundred percent getting some rounds in here and there. Uh, just finished a movie last night. So we had back to back movies here in Vegas, happy to be working again and things, seeing things starting to open up a little more. And certainly happy to see the PFL coming back online here on April 23rd. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. PFL is, uh, man, I tell you what, like I said, <laughs> the year they were gone, we all missed them. And 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 this tournament, the, the season they're putting together this year looks incredible. A lot of new talent, guys like Rory McDonald coming in. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm sure uh, you're going to be uh, enjoying every minute of it. Absolutely. Can't wait for uh, some of these new, new uh, people that we've signed. Uh, Anthony Pettis. Uh, Fabricio Verdum, you, you mentioned Rory, uh, Clarissa Shields is going to foray into MMA. I'm, I'm anxious to see how she transitions because uh, a tremendous boxer. And so hopefully, uh, and I know she's training down there with uh, Winkle John and uh, in Albuquerque and Holly Holm, and that's a great place for her. So uh, it's going to be a really good year. Absolutely. Well, Randy, I really appreciate the time. Obviously, the Randy Couture story is available right now. I watched all four episodes. It's a tremendous documentary. And I know, again, you're not an egotistical guy, but I thought they did a tremendous job with this thing. And it was just a lot of fun watching and reminiscing and seeing all that stuff. And again, I know you're not a guy who ever sat there and touted yourself or said, I'm this or I'm that, but uh, it's got to feel good. All the things you accomplished, uh, it, it, they did a really, really good job with this documentary. 
Well, I was honored, honored that uh, PFL Productions wanted to step up and do do the series, and and uh, they did it justice for sure. And all my friends and family that got involved, it, it was pretty cool. Definitely an honor for me. Absolutely. Well, Randy, it's always a pleasure to catch up with you. Glad you're doing well. Look forward to seeing you during the PFL season. And thank you so much for taking the time for me. I really appreciate it. Thanks, bud. I appreciate you having me on. Thank hey, you. Talk to you soon.